Hey there, welcome to Board Game Hot Takes. My name is Tim. And this is Chris. This is Adam. And today we're going to be featuring our top five favorite player boards. This is a companion episode to our top five favorite game boards that we did a few weeks back. So if you're interested in hearing about our favorite game boards, like the central board of a game, go back and listen to that one. But today we're going to be talking about the player boards, the boards that are sitting in front of each player that only they're interacting with. Before we jump into the list, I'm curious, did you guys have anything that you were really looking for? What gets you excited about player boards? Yeah, this was a fun question to explore, Tim. I was looking at player boards that are that are functional, maybe add something to the game, help organize the game, a little extra nice production or beauty was a plus for me. And I do like a nice recessed player board. So that helps me organize, helps me organize my thoughts, keeps the components in place. I tried to shy away from the the sneeze and scramble effect like terraforming mars those early player boards there where if you had your cubes in there if you sneezed you might shoot all your little cubes everywhere if you bump the table then everything's scattered and you have no idea what was going on anywhere on your own player board so i tried to stay away from those were some of the negatives that i kept away from player boards i don't know if that makes any sense what i just said but that's kind of what i was tending towards when i looked at player boards. I'll have more specific reasons of why certain player boards stood out to me when we get to them. Yes. Well, that makes perfect sense to me. Adam is my spirit animal and my answer is exactly the same as what his was. So I don't have a lot to add, but certainly uh, beauty was one of the things that I appreciate in a player board. Things that organ help you organize are great. And I definitely would not give short shrift to the value and impact of a two-layer player boards. So there are going to be a lot of those on my list. Two layer was a criteria that I think was very helpful for me to define some of my favorites, but it wasn't the only thing I was looking at. I was definitely looking at a combination of usability, you know, how, how organized is the player board? How much am I interacting with it? How, what unique things does that player board do that makes me want to sit there and look at my own player board? And in some cases, there's a great use of, of artwork or theme added into the player board itself. And I've got a couple examples of those as well. So it's one of these cases where you can kind of get all those things if the game supports it, right? Every game doesn't need a big player board that has all these gizmos and different pieces to it. But some player boards really stand out as something that I have a lot of fun playing with. And, and interacting with. Well, on that note, Tim, my number five player board, I'll start off here, was for Baseball Highlights 2045. The player boards here, there's no central game board, so it's just all player boards. So it's kind of a cheat, but oh well. The player boards here are a baseball diamond, the infield of a baseball diamond. And it helps with the organization. You're playing your car down to the middle to the pitcher's mound, the kind of the central location of the player board. You've got your deck of cards, either on the top left or top right, depending on which side of the player board you use. You've got your discard deck right below that. You've got your on-deck batter, maybe your ace in the hole, your secret card that you're saving for later on in the game or for a pinch hitter that you're going to bring in later. And you've got the bases where you're actually moving these little pawns that are involved during the game. You're moving those guys around the bases, just like in baseball. So it's so thematic. It goes so well with the the game and the card play here. There is no recess player board here. I think this is my one player board that didn't have the dual layer or the recess little slots for little things to go on, but oh well, it's so good anyway. I couldn't help but pick the player board for baseball highlights 2045. Hey Adam, I got a question for you. One of the things about this game that seems kind of odd to me, and, and I'll go back for a second and say, I really do love the player boards on this. I mean, the reason for all the reasons that you said, but it strikes me as an odd game to have so much of the action taking place on the player board, considering that it's the ball field, right? So it seems like there should be a central board where all the stuff happens. It, talk about that. Does that bother you at all? Yeah, that's a good point, Chris. The way this game is run you're kind of dueling against the other players player board so you play a card on yours and the first line of text either accelerates your runners or gets you more hits right away or prevents them from having hits so you're kind of going to their player board and removing things off of their player board so the two player boards are opposing each other but you get to interact with yours and the other players player board so Right. The way they did this here is pretty unique in game design. You get to go to the other player's player board and, and mess with it or fool with it or, or try to take things away or add things to your own. So yeah, it's that's a good point, Chris. Whatever they did here, it works. So no central game board, but I love it. Yeah, it's a cool game. My number five is Eclipse, Second Dawn for the Galaxy, designed by Tuco Takokalio and published by Laudapelt.com. 
FI. Now, I'm going to apologize a bit because one of the things I tried to do is find games that I don't talk about all the time. I've been trying to do that a lot on our lists recently is not to keep talking about the same games. But I found with this list, so many of the best game boards or the player boards are the games that I like so much. So I don't know if that's just the fact that I love a game that has a great player board or just they the great designers do great player boards or what. But you're going to hear some games that you've heard of before from me. So Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy is actually an interesting choice in my mind because there is both a fail and a success here. There's two player boards that every player gets. One of them is the actual civilization board. That's where you have your technologies that get built up. It tells you about the details of the particular civilization that you're using. It provides the ships that you end up building up and adding technologies to. And then you also have an income board. And the income board has all the little cubes and that as you place cubes out on the board and uh, basically putting bases out, then you open up spots on your income board and that creates more income that you get. The income board is absolutely awesome. It was the first time I played a game where your income was revealed that way. By putting something out, you also opened up a space that gave you a benefit that would be repeating when you went to do your income. And one of the great things I love about this part of the player board is it's two levels, two layers, and there's little slots for all the little uh, all the little cubes that mark your income. And then there's also these neat little arrows that you use to mark what your current inventory is of the different resources that you're going to get. So it's really nice, two players, very elegant. On the other hand, the main civilization board is kind of like what Adam was talking about with sneeze and scatter, I think is what you said, which was great because I know exactly what you're talking about. I said sneeze and scramble. Well, sneeze and scatter is way better, Chris. You elevated that. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's way better. They, they, they both get the point across. And unfortunately, in Eclipse, as much as the player board itself is actually quite effective and keeps you very well organized, it also has you putting a bunch of chits on this flat piece of cardboard that doesn't hold the pieces very well. So I get very frustrated by that. Uh, and I wish that it was as effective for holding the pieces as it was for actually conveying the information that it's trying to get across, at which it's very good. So I wish that they had done two layers for both of those. They didn't, but it still manages to make my top five at the bottom of the list. Yeah, in all fairness, though, with Eclipse, the thing that you would want to hold in place because of the you know, do a layer are those little action chips. That's kind of the main thing that can move. And those don't actually need to be recorded in place. You really, really, you, mainly you just need to record how many you've used and, uh, and, and they stack. So it's like, even if you had a dual layer, you'd have them stacked on top of each other. I'm not sure it would make much, much difference. The other things you're putting on the board are the text, which are pretty clearly laid out. Like they're always going to go left to right from the smallest to the biggest. And, and then, you know, so like, I'm not sure that a two layer player board would actually have been that useful in that case. And so I get it. It would have been nice, that thicker feel to it and stuff like that. But I'm not sure the functionality would have been worth the extra cost. I mean, that game is expensive enough as it is. Yeah, I'm of two minds on this one. I considered putting this one on my list here. I'm glad you did, Chris, because it's a great player board. But the one dimensionality, that flatness of it, it does kind of bug me for some reason. I think Tim's right. It doesn't necessarily... But there's so much stuff. You get all the blueprints for your ships on there, all the different techs, all your little shields from the combat, and your little slidey circles, your flat circles. If you bump that thing, everything's going to shift. And you're like, oh, no, what's going on? You'd be able to figure it out pretty easily. But man, I feel like a game like this almost deserves that recessed player board to match the rest of the production with this thing. Maybe there's some overlays. I'll have to go spend some more money carelessly for some overlays on this so I can stack more stuff in there. But yeah, great pick, Chris. Yeah, it's definitely not a fatal problem. I'll agree with you on that, Tim. But but Adam's right. It does deserve better. This is a game that deserves better. And you should be willing to pay the extra price for it. Okay, but I do want to say one thing about that <laughs> player board. And, and I agree. I had forgotten about the player trays that kind of track the income stuff. That's really nice. Mm-hmm. That works great. But the other yeah. thing about the main kind of the faction player boards is those ship blueprints at the top are cool because each of these player boards has different ships printed on the top of them. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you get to kind of build those out on your player board, that's, that's such a cool part. Like such a cool, uh, you know, feature of this game and that exists right on your main player board. So I think it's, I think it's a great pick. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, my first pick here, and I'm going to be doing a little bit of cheating tonight, mainly just because 
I had a few categories of player boards that just worked really well. So I'm going to I'm going to call out five specific ones tonight, but I'll be mentioning a couple that I think are worth noting in the same you know, kind of in the same grouping. Uh, the first one I want to call out is just because I've played it very recently and it really stood out to me. I knew we were we were thinking about doing it, this topic and I was playing this game and I was like, I've got to mention this game. And that's Lacrimosa. Now, if you guys remember, it's been a little while since I played it with you, but Lacrimosa has this wonderful triple layer player board. And when I say triple layer, basically it not only is double layer in some cases where you're going to basically kind of be putting tokens and you know there's little trackers on the board that you're following your income track and your different story point tracks on there so those all work great you're going to be taking four turns per round and every turn you're basically going to slot one card in the top of your player board and that's going to indicate what action you're taking you're going to slot one card in the bottom and that's going to indicate what kind of story point income you're going to get at the end of the round And they slot in just wonderfully in there. They just slide between these two layers so that you only see the relevant information that you need to on the board. And it all just works so great. So this is just a wonderful, beautiful player board. It also has over on the right hand side, it has the little note symbols that you can basically take off and put out on the main board in that little area control thing. But each of them are clearly laid out as far as which note you remove, what benefit are you getting, and then you replace it with the kind of the composer that's filling in that note section. So everything just comes together really well in this player board. And one last thing I'll call out and something I think that Devere did just wonderfully with this game. And I think a lot of other uh, publishers should look at this is that this is a mostly language independent game. The only thing that you need, of course, is your rule book. But the player boards were nice enough. And I think this is great when player boards do this. They kind of give you the key rules. What are the key actions you can take? And they spell it out on the board. But you can't do that language independent without making completely different boards, right? Oh, except Devere did. What they did is they gave a little punch board for each language that you needed in the box. For each of the player boards, you've got one little strip of cardboard that's in English, one that's in German, one that's in whatever other languages they printed it in. And you just slot that into your dual layer player board. And then once you're once it's in there, you never even have to take it out, right? It's like that can be your permanent version of the board. Uh, so they made it language independent enough where that's the only thing they had to adjust from a component perspective but having those tips on a player board that's one of the things i actually really like about some good player boards is when they kind of give you the rules right there if somebody needs to reference what can i do on my turn you know when can i take an income stuff like that it's all printed right there so this was a really exceptional player board the other ones i wanted to mention with this though really quickly because they are both standouts as well is two other Devere games that were recently published. One was the Red, Red Cathedral, which I think was published about two to three years ago now. And then the second was a follow-up that they they put in that same line called the White Castle. And both of these have wonderful dual-layer player boards. The player boards really bring in very cool and interesting mechanisms for the for the games. But since they were also Devere, I wanted to call that out. I think Devere is really doing amazing stuff with production and their player boards is a, is a key part of that. Tim, a couple things I want to say about that. Gosh darn, I miss this game, Lacrimoso. What a fun time I had playing it. I don't really remember much about it. The player boards are gorgeous now. I'm looking at it here. Good call out, Tim. It's making me want to come back to this game and play it so bad. And secondly, what's up with your voice? It sounds like you are in the same room as me tonight. I can hear you so clearly and amazingly. You sound great. (laughs) Okay, so here's the story. I literally, I just bought a condo like two miles away from Adam so I can be back in Long Beach to game with him occasionally. Literally just moved in today for the first time. I don't have any furniture in my house. I couldn't get the Wi-Fi working. So five minutes before we started recording, I was like, Adam, help me. I need I need you to help me. So I'm over here using his Wi-Fi, using his power, sitting on an actual chair, which is great. And recording in the same room with Adam tonight. And I'm so jealous. Pleasure to have you over here, Tim. Hey, that's a, a great call out there, Tim. I, I love that one too. And I had completely forgotten about the three layer player boards and the slotting of cards, but you know, it's bringing back some fond memories of playing that one. And I'm definitely looking forward to playing Lacrimosa again. This is such a fun game, you guys. I got to tell you, I've been back to it several times since we played it together. And every time we play it, I'm just in love with this game. And I, I'm going to buy it. I just haven't had the chance and I'm not sure why, because everybody that I play games with around here owns a copy already, but I love the game so much that I, I want to own it. It's fantastic. Great. Well, next up on my list is Hegemony, Lead Your Class to Victory. This is designed by, oh boy, this is always a tough one to say, designed by Vangelis Begayertakis and Varnavis Timiatu, and the publisher is Hegemonic Project Games. But the player boards here 
are yeah i'm almost regretting this pick now but not really you have to have the deluxe edition really and you do get the the recessed player board or the dual layer player they call it dual layered because the second layer provides those recesses for the little the little people to fit into your workers fit in there and you have your little cylinders that fit in there marching across this this game is so complex but the organization of the whole entire game including the central game board is fantastic but looking at the player boards you need that extra organization as well so there's a little spot for money which is you know, that's actually way too small of a spot. So your money's going to be all over the place. Then you have your influence cubes. There's a little spot for that. But each player board then has a spot for what's kind of super important. So looking at the working class, the red one, you want to get your unions across the bottom. You have that. You want to get your prosperity moving across the middle. So there's a slot for that. The recess is just enough to hold these little components. And of course, you have the population going across the top. Depending on how many workers you have, that corresponds with your actual population. So just enough organization, just enough class and simplicity, but also beauty to make it stand out for me. And that's the player boards from Hegemony Lead Your Class to Victory. Nobody, no, nothing, nobody cares about that. <laughs> Chris, Chris, Chris doesn't even want to mention anything here. So I'll just jump in and say that I think Hegemony's main board was almost on my list of, of game boards. I'm not sure about the player boards, Adam. I mean, mm. I get it. They are clean and they are interesting that they are you're very unique, right? Every player is kind of does something a little bit different. But I did feel like the player boards was one area where, like you said, there wasn't really quite enough space for the different components you had to keep in there and stuff like that. So I don't know. Maybe this will take another play and at some point I'll reassess. Yeah, you know what? This is a tough sell even to myself. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I was maintaining a respectful silence. <laughs> I, I don't want to... Let, let it not be said that I was not respecting Adam's choices. <laughs> but I, I have a hard time getting enthusiastic about a lot ah. of this game. So that maybe that's just my shortcoming. Coming in at number four on my list is Distilled, designed by Dave Beck and published by Paverson Games. I'm not sure what it is, but I definitely have a thing going with two part player boards tonight. This is another one that has that same thing. In distilled, you have a distillery board that is one layer, unfortunately, where you put various pieces of your distillery, upgrades, your employees. There's a head office where you put your distiller. And then there's a pantry where you put all of your ingredients. There's a place where you store your casks, where you're aging your liquors. And so that is all nice because there's a place for each of those stacks of cards. And you're going to keep going back to them over and over and over again. And that makes it so easy to organize. It's only one layer, but it doesn't bother me in the same way that it does with, say, Eclipse. Because here you are talking about cards that you're going to have to keep manipulating throughout the game. So it would be odd to have them in some sort of a recessed area. Whereas I feel like in Eclipse those little tokens that you're using to represent a technology or something like that are going to go in and they're going to stay there. So that makes more sense. This is still very well organized, uh, even if it does have a tendency for cards to slide around a little bit. But you also have this little sideboard where you have your recipes. And there's two things about this that I really like. One of them is that unlike the main player board, the distillery board, your recipe board looks like a little menu. And on the left side, it's got these little square holes where you can put in the indicators that show that you know how to do a, per a particular recipe where you can use that recipe and then that marks it off for you. But in the place where you actually have the recipes themselves, there are about, I don't know, at this point, like 20 different versions of the, the recipe cards and you can slot in whichever one you happen to be playing. And now with all the expansions, which I got not too long ago, you can slot in a million different recipe cards. And that's really fun because it does add a lot of uh, flavor to the game. Haha, <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, it adds a lot of variety and it slots in there so nicely that you put it in there and then you forget about it other than to use it to figure out what it is you need to do. And I like that part of it. I thought it feels very good. And the slotting definitely is a nice feature in this board. Interesting pick, Chris. Yeah, I, I you know... I was trying to think, I was thinking about Distilled as I was going through this list. This is another another category where I kind of looked at like the top thousand games on Board Game Geek and then every other game that I played over the last five years. And uh, Distilled crossed my mind, but kind of like Hegemony, I'm not sure it, I'm not sure it stands out enough about the usability and the functionality of the board. I feel like you guys, I hope your next couple picks really like pick it up a little bit. I'm, I'm excited for what's coming next. Well, I think Chris, like I did, kind of slid their weakest 
pick into the second slot to <laughs> build up towards that grand finale. I don't, I don't know. I see what you're saying here, Chris. I'm kind of with Tim on this one. Wow. You have all these cards. It kind of looks a little disheveled. You know, you got the little <laughs> tiny cardboard shits going across the top. Those guys are all, unless you have like a, a ruler to organize these things, and your cards are just going to be all flimsy, <laughs> especially if you're Tim. He doesn't, Tim doesn't care about keeping anything straight, which just blows my what? mind. What? Yeah. Tim is, you look at his resources. He's got resources just jumbled in a pile and mixed together. It's, it's crazy playing games with Tim. So this player board is okay, Chris. Oh man, I I feel the need to defend this one. I mean, you've got a little office where you put your character. You've got a pantry where you put your little ingredients. I don't know. I think it's charming and cool. <sighs> Those are fighting words, dude. I certainly love your spirit. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nicely done, Adam. Nicely like done. Yeah. All right. Well, here's my next. Uh, my next pick is again kind of a category. So I'm going to mention a couple of games here, but this is a category of games where the player board is almost where the whole game is played out. And so I was almost hesitant to use some of these games because they didn't just feel like player boards. They felt like the main game. But I think they're worth calling out. And there was a couple of exceptional ones here. And, and uh, so let me give you an example. Okay, A couple of the picks that I had, or a couple of the games that are in this category, for example, are Orleone. Orleone is a game where there is a main board. And there's a lot of stuff that you interact with on the main board. But most of your turn is picking actions on your player board and you're literally putting tokens out there and kind of laying them out and paladins of the west kingdom was another one where most of the game is played on your player board and there's all kinds of stuff you're doing there you're you're taking your actions by putting them there so it was a little hard to pick this but there were a couple games that i thought stood out enough that that it was that it was worth calling out the the player boards here the last couple that i want to call out aside from orleone and paladins of the west kingdom that kind of have this category one is Russian Railroads. This is a game that is a it, the main actions you're selecting is a central worker placement game. But other than that, everything else you're doing is on this main board where you have these different tracks and you're kind of building up rail on these tracks. And as you hit it, you get bonuses. You're slotting in these technologies at the bottom of your track. You're placing trains on the track itself. Almost everything you're doing in this game is played on the player boards. But that's not my top pick. That's not my actual number four. My number four this is Marrakesh. Marrakesh is a game that was published in 2022. This is a Steffenfeld game. And these player boards are amazing. This is, of course, the Marrakesh Collector's Edition. They have come out with a Marrakesh Essential Edition, which is a toned down, lighter game. But the Collector's Edition has, everybody has these huge two-layer player boards. And what you're doing in the game is you're basically, uh, everybody's kind of placing these different colored workers into a tower. And then depending on the workers that come out, you're going to start to draft the actions that you can take. They may end up being the workers that you put in there, but they could be workers that other people put in there. But once you take those workers, you are going to be interacting with this player board almost exclusively. Every action that you get based on the workers you put in there is going to give you all these different tracks, these little, you know, in the city of Marrakesh, you've got these little regions of your city. You've got the olive grove and you've got the boat. There's like a river that you can interact with and there's a central market. There's all these things you're doing and you're basically putting these tokens on these boards and filling up these little dual layer player slots. So all over the place, you end up by the end of the game, you just got these little tokens plugged into your player board all over the place. This player board is just amazing. It's fun to interact with. And it's just got all these little mini games on on it that you get to play with throughout the course of the game. So I think as far as a game that where the most of the game is played on your player board, I think this is a wonderful example of it. Well, Tim already expanding his top five player boards out to top 30 or 40 player boards. But looking at Marrakesh here, it looks amazing. It looks so complex and so fun. I don't know. Call me just a sucker, but there's so many different little colors and putting all these little pegs and all these little different slots. I have no idea what's going on in this game, but it looks cool. That was one of the one of the first times you talked about this game, Tim. I looked at this and I was like, I want to play that game solely because of these player boards. It looks fascinating and like no other player board that I've seen. I, I'm with Adam on that one. I think that is definitely one of the coolest looking player boards I've ever seen. And there was a few episodes back where I had asked Tim for your recommendation on which Stefan Feld to play next. And I was actually a little bit disappointed that you didn't say Marrakesh because I remembered this board from when you talked about it and just how impressive it looked. So, you know, that doesn't necessarily make the best game, I guess, but the player board sure is a piece of work. Well, the good news is that this is the next Steffenfeld you're probably going to play because I am bringing it to our next <laughs> DJHT Con in Big Bear next month. And 
I think it is now my favorite Steffenfeld game, and it's beat out Castle wow. of Burgundy for me. Wow. The reason I didn't really? recommend yeah, the only reason I didn't recommend it to you, Chris, was because I'd recently talked about it and I wanted to talk about something different. So I told, I gave you Merlin, and I also do think you'd enjoy <laughs> Merlin. I thought it has a more interesting theme for you. But I'm, I'm very excited to see what you guys think of this game if you end up liking it. I think it's a super fun, very interactive game, even though a lot of the games played on your main player board you can definitely impact based on what you're drafting, how other people can play their game. And there is a central board that has a little bit of interaction there as well that you're you're you know really having to pay attention to what other people are doing. So I think the whole package of this game is just fantastic, but those player boards are pretty spectacular. So wait to try it. Up next for me is the player boards for Planet Unknown. The designers here are Ryan Lambert and Adam Reberg, published by Adam's Apple Games. You know, everybody talks about the lazy Susan for this game. You just spin it around, pick your little Tetris-like tile out and put it on your planet. But what I think is cool is the variety in the little player boards off to the side. So there's a couple. This is going Chris style here. There's your your planet one, which, okay, yeah, there's your planet and your rover and you're putting your little Tetris. There's like a thousand different ones of those. But I really like the thing over on the right, your kind of corporation, I think it is. You have these five, one, two, three, four, five tracks that you're climbing up. You're moving these little cubes up these tracks and they give you little bonuses as you go up. They maybe let you move up one of the other tracks as you go up. There's also different bonuses that are included with each one of these different kind of corporations. So there's, I don't know, a few of these handful of these to go around too, and you're picking a different one each game. And it just keeps the game so organized, has these nice little bonuses. That's what this game is. Basically, you're just going for combo here, combo there. And uh, all of that while you're filling in this beautiful planet full of Tetris shapes. I think the player board here is great. And one of the main attractions of this pretty fantastic, pretty light and very fun game, Planet Unknown. That's another one I want to try because I love me some Tetrominoes and this is a cool looking set. This is a great game. It's it's really fun and it's on Board Game Arena, Chris, so you should try it sometime soon. Yeah. Now, my first play of it, I was, I was very blown away by it. I thought it was extremely fun but my expectations of it have held up which is that it probably doesn't matter a whole lot what you do you place a tile you get bonuses you move up a track you get more bonuses yeah but it's all fun so you know who cares um but yeah great player boards the the planets themselves there's a huge variety in the box of like different planets that are kind of asymmetric and have different abilities on them so that's cool that you have that to interact with but those track boards are really fun too great great choice oh yeah finally Oh, man. All right. Well, coming in at number three on my list is Cthulhu Death May Die, designed by Rob Davio and Eric Lang and published by Simon Games. The main event in my mind for this player board is the way that it has slots where you can put things. But there's a twist to it that I want to talk about that makes this particularly exciting. And that is that there are so many different potential characters you could play, so many different players, so many different characters that... I think by the time you get all of the various uh, expansion content, you've probably got this stack of like 30 characters you can play. I mean, I've got an entire box that is nothing but playable characters. So how do you solve the problem of having a multi-level board for these playable characters when you have that many of them? Well, the answer for Simon was to create an overlay where you can slot in any one of those cards. And it works absolutely wonderfully because there's multiple things that you're tracking on that player board. You're tracking your madness level, which is super important. It depends. Basically, it dictates how powerful you are, what your abilities are. You're also tracking your strength. You're tracking your health. There are multiple things that you're trying to track. And the little cool tokens, if you have the deluxe version, it's got the little cool tentacle tokens that you can uh, can put in there. Just look and feel so nice in those slots. And the slots, you can put them on any player board because all you have to do is take the little uh, plastic overlay and slide it over the card of the player that you want to do. And it's got a top and a bottom. So it's not just something sitting on top of your player board. And it also, that lets you slot in cards on the sides because you're also slotting in some cards for items and things like that. So the way that they solve the problem of having that much flexibility for that many different characters and still having that kind of a fine high level of production, I think was absolutely perfect. Uh, One of my favorite player boards of all time. Chris, this is a really interesting choice and a game that I seriously considered for this because of the way that 
depending on the player board you're playing with. And like you said, there's, I think, more than 30. I'm about to get all the, mm. the next Kickstarter content. I'm going to end up with like 50 different characters and <laughs> each of them is a player board. But it's that all the stuff you're doing on the player board is fun. When you get Madness and you you know get to upgrade one of your your attributes, that's fun. When you're rolling the dice and getting Madness and that track across the top is moving and you hit one of those spots where you got to trigger your psychopathy or whatever it's called, that's really fun. So there's a lot of fun stuff here going. Now, I want to call out, Chris, that the plastic tray that you're talking about, that was a Kickstarter exclusive in the first Kickstarter. That does not come in the main box. Oh. I'm excited because I'm going to be getting it with this next Kickstarter. They re-release that, but that's not something you normally get. So normally it is just a flat player board. And I think that was the main detraction for me calling it out even though i think the player boards work great here the other thing you didn't mention with the player boards is that the basic actions you can take are spelled out on the left hand side and as Mm -hmm. i mentioned with lacrimosa it's great when you've got a little bit of a reminder you don't have to have a separate card it's printed right on your player board as to what you can do so this was a great pick now i know adam's going to be talking about a game coming up here that i think would have done these player boards even better, even better than the plastic overlays you're talking about. So I'll, I'll mention that again when he talks about that game. But uh, otherwise, yeah, Cthulhu Death May Die, these player boards are very fun to interact with, very fun to even make the choice at the beginning of the game of which character you're going to play and which player board you're going to start with. Yeah, one thing that I forgot to mention was that it also has a little bio of your character too, which is a lot of fun because if you're playing this game, it probably means that you're into storytelling in games and that's a great part of the story in this game. As are the different bits of psychopathy and your insanity levels that raise the kind of crazy things you're able to do. But I'm also glad that you brought up that thing about the trays not being part of the base game. I did not realize that. I wonder if you can buy them basically aftermarket from Simon, if that's something you can buy just as an add-on or if it's only something you can get from the Kickstarter. Do you, do you happen to know? Well, I think that was only available in the unspeakable mm. box, which was that Kickstarter exclusive thing that come on tends to do with their Kickstarters. Yeah. And it wasn't available again for the last four years until they just released this new game, this new, uh, this new Kickstarter version for season three and season four. The problem is that unspeakable box well, they knew they could price it up and it's like $120. <laughs> now, of course, it doesn't just include those as content stuff, but I'm pretty sure that only came in that box. I can't promise that, though. I, I have not looked to see if I could just buy the tray separate. Gotcha. I am looking here. I I did some hardcore internet research by that. I mean, I just typed go through the death may die and Etsy into my Google search. And I came up with some interesting trays that are available third party. So yeah, there's these, you can get similar trays. It looks like that are out there, these overlays that'll slide right in there and that'll work for you just fine. So they're out there. Nice. And some good points about the player board here. I don't know if I've ever played this game with those overlays you're talking about. That looks handy. I love any kind of thing. They keep stuff in place and makes nice little circles and this and that. So yeah, nice pick here, Chris. Up next is Revive for me. This is designed by Helge Messner, Christian Amson Osby, Elif. Svensson and Anna Wormland, published by Aporta Games. Chris, just want to remind you, these are also some of the designers and publishers that make Capital Lux 2. <laughs> we're not talking about that. We're talking about the player board here. Why do I like the player board here? It's amazing. It's dual layered. You've got slots galore. Chris, I heard you talking about slots all day long over there. We've got all kinds of slots here. We've got all kinds of recesses for tracking this and tracking that. You basically got your own little mini game here and these little tracks that you're following. Do I want to take the, the gray track this way? I want to take the yellow track. I want to take the green track this way. If I combine these two tracks, I get to unlock this power. If I combine these other two tracks, I get to unlock this mega power. I need to march up here so I can get this bonus. Oh, I can get pick my own bonus if I go this way. You've got so many trackers, so much information, so many cards that are going here that can be placed here and then turn sideways and put down here. I... Love this player board. Not to mention the game itself is freaking fantastic. A lot of that for me was the excitement of the player board. Also, what's the thing? You slot in something on the left side. There's this little wedge, this little divot over on the left side where you slot in like your faction or your guy or your leader, whatever it is. There's a little, just a little wedge out that you uh, you slot in your leader, 
faction. Yeah, it's like it's like your faction board where all of your workers and buildings and everything are. So that uh, that's like a whole separate player board that unlocks yeah. all. It, this is yeah. You, I could just talk all day about these player boards. I'm glad you. I'm I'm glad you're doing it for me. Yeah, I wanted to. I wanted. I knew you guys would pick this one if I didn't pick it. But this was probably this was fighting for my number one pick. This is my number two pick. This is fighting for my number one pick. Just the way it displays the information. You've got to own your little sort of mini games. I've already said all this stuff, but. I just want to keep talking about it because it's so beautiful. The artwork on it. Come on, look at this thing. It's like evokes this crazy machine and little wires and cables and plugs going here and there. It's just fascinating to look at this thing. So that's the player boards from Revive. As as great a game as that was, I think that machine was my favorite part of it. (laughs) And the player board definitely made a huge difference. Another game I'm planning to bring to our next BGHT con so we can all play it together again. Nice. Great. All right, so my number three is a game that we've talked about a decent amount, but I think you you got to check this game out. It is such a fantastic game with so many interesting things going on, and this is Le Grand Ha. And even though the game, I think, if you played the original version, it would work just fine, but the new Deluxe Edition is wonderful for a couple of reasons. The player board does so much of the work in this game. Like Lacrimosa, it has almost what you'd call a triple-layer player board, Not exactly. It's a little bit lighter in that you are slotting cards in here. Slotting cards, these are multi-use cards that you're going to get a chance to play throughout the course of the game. You're either slotting them in the bottom to represent some special abilities you've got. You've got three places you can slot them in at the bottom. You can slot them into the left-hand side. These will create fields where every round you're going to get crops growing. Or you can slot them in on the right-hand side. They're going to create upgrades to your farm. They're going to give you, uh, you know, extra, like, places to hold your your livestock your pigs they're going to give you extra income they're going to give you extra cards you can play and stuff like that so you've got these great choices you're making with these multi-use cards and they slot into the sides of the boards what's different from lacrimosa here is that the cards really just slide underneath the board but there's little blockers so it's it's raised but only where the cards go so as you slot the cards in they can't get they won't slip under like space base or something like that where you just lose the cards if you accidentally bump it under there so they work really well on top of that on on the main board above it outside of these card slots there are all these indented spaces where you're going to be putting tokens and what's cool about this player board is that you can get all these different types of resources you can get all these so you can get livestock and get different crops you can get these special trade goods that can basically be traded in for a bunch of other stuff and a lot of the trade good or a lot of the the crops and livestock they can be upgraded to special types of goods but you don't have to represent those with all kinds of different resources all you have is these little hex tokens And you just put the hex tokens on whichever section of the player board you want to represent that you've got one of those resources. And somehow it works so well. And I, 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 when I first read the rules on this and I looked at that, I was like, that's so anti-thematic and it's just like generic components, but somehow it works well. And this player board is a big part of it. But beyond that, one of the key features of this game, and I think what makes it fun is there are all these, what they call anytime actions. These are basically free things you can do at any time where you can basically convert, you can sell goods, you can buy goods, you can convert one resource to another type by paying money for it. And all of that's represented on your player board by basically showing like, okay, if you want to convert grapes into wine well there's a spot for your grapes and if you got a token there there's a little arrow with the cost next to it that shows what it would take to tr- convert it into wine and so the player board just represents all this stuff in a way that is very usable you never get confused about it you've also got this section where you're buying roof tiles over the course of the game and you're covering over negative points as you're moving through it and when you do that you can also flip the roof tiles over and get bonuses so there's just so much stuff going on in this player board uh, oh, those multi-use cards, you can put them in the top to make wheelbarrows that you can sell and, and send out to the main market. This is a wonderful game that has a lot of unique things going on, and that player board lets you do a lot of it, and it's just all laid out there. Now, the new collector's version or the, the special edition of this game has a beautiful player board, and it represents your local farm. So it's got this great artwork of you know farmers walking around, and the roof tiles go on your main farmhouse, but you can see the different parts of your farm represented in the artwork here, and it's vibrant, and it's it's it looks great. This is like a, a prime example of a great player board. Yeah, I'm looking at pictures of the deluxe set here, Tim. Up in the top left, you've got a little one of the little hats, one of the little it looks like the ribbon, and then like a little a little pig shaped token that's gonna fit right in there. Not to mention these other shapes along the right side for your income. What a delightful design. It's just super charming and fun to look at. The detail here is great. I could look at this thing all night and just be captivated. 
Yeah, great choice, Tim. And I think one of the things that I really appreciate about this is that it combines two of the best parts of this game. I think that not only does Lagranja, especially in the deluxe version, have one of the best player boards, but this game is also, it could definitely be on my top five list for best use of multi-use cards. Mm -hmm. Having those different things you can do with those, those cards within your farm and then, you know, the board lets you actually use that in a very effective way. So I love how it combines those two things. Super duper fun. I had a great time playing this when we played it here in Portland recently. And speaking of games that we played in Portland recently that had great player boards, coming in at number two on my list is My Father's Work by TC Petty and published by Renegade Game Studios. I gave the nod to this game largely just for the uniqueness of the design of this player board, because it does not look like any player board that I've seen before in its shape, which is completely irregular. In this game, you're playing a mad scientist, and the main board is the village where you get to send your folks in, your your servants, or go yourself to do various things. And then your board, your player board, is your estate. And it has a few things going on there. It has places where you can put updates to your estate. It has places where you can do various, you know, arcane experiments and things. Uh, It has your laboratory. And there's this interesting kind of storytelling aspect of it where you have different characters that you might play. And one of them is your caretaker. And everybody knows the caretaker is too creepy. You know, this little Igor-like character that he can't be going into town. He he only stay and do things at your estate. Uh, It also has on this board a place where you record knowledge and recording knowledge is again, this sort of, you're the mad scientist. What things have you learned as you're passing it down from generation to generation? What's in your, uh, your knowledge board are the things that you can carry with you and make it easier to do experiments based on that knowledge down the road. But I'm kind of glossing over here, the thing that makes this really cool. And that's how it looks. You just have to look at a picture of it. It is wildly irregularly shaped. It's shaped like this bizarre, uh, you know, Transylvanian estate with uh, with the turrets. There's not actually a graveyard out there, but it sure looks like there ought to be a graveyard out there. And on top of all that, not only is it beautiful, but it's also super functional, has really nice iconography. And the place where you put your knowledge tokens or your upgrades Those are all two layers, so you can slot those pieces in. They fit in so nicely, and they won't be sliding around. So first of all, this is just an absolutely beautiful player board, and it has just oodles of functionality as well. Great pick, Chris. For uh, I can't can't deny that at all. I think one of the cool things about great player boards is when they can tie in the theme, and my father's work does that exceptionally by giving you a building where you're where your workers live and interact and fantastic. I remember like there was this track on the bottom where you can place like upgrade tiles or something as well. So there's space for everything here. By the way, we didn't call this out before about main boards, but this one was a really interesting one because I remember when we, you open up the main board on this game, it's kind of this big weird shape board with a big empty space in the middle. And that's because then you, pull out like a storybook and you unfold it to the page you want to be on and put that right in the middle of the board, which I thought was great that they actually gave you a board to put that on this. This this is one more example of how this, this game went above and beyond in every area of production. But uh, yeah, the player board's a good choice. Yep. Yeah. So the first time I've taken a hard look at the player boards here, the game itself and what a great pick, Chris, I don't see any pointed arches or flying buttresses, but I would say it kind of has this gothic feel to it. And it looks so cool and so evocative. What a cool looking uh, player board. All right. So moving to my number two is a game that I don't like that much, but, <laughs> but I think that the player boards are exceptional and I think they're worth noting here. This is Carnegie. Now we reviewed this game probably about a year ago and I enjoyed the game a decent amount on my first play of it. And I, th- I think I said at the time, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to explore it more. I'd like to play it more. And I've unfortunately played it a lot, uh, dozens of times by people inviting me on board game arena and almost every play. I like it less and less. Um, this is a game that just did not hold up. It didn't have enough variety to keep me interested. It didn't have enough fun choices to keep me interested. Not to say there isn't still cool things going on about it, but I felt like it just isn't, it's not a great hit for me. But the main player boards do a couple things really well. Number one, they represent your headquarters. Each of you play a corporation in Carnegie era times, and they have a couple. Basically, it's like four a four story old brick administrative building that you would see in any you know kind of like 
uh, you know, industrial area, area area of any major city that's been around for the last 200 years. And uh, on the first floor, you have, of course, your main floor, which has your elevator, and it's got like your HR offices and administrative offices. And on the next floor above there, maybe you've got some engineering departments, but the rest of the building's empty, and it's ready to be filled in with the departments you're going to be filling it. So as you build up your company, as you create new departments, you get to take these tiles and put them into your building. And it's really well represented. The building ends up looking like an administrative building with all these different areas. And there's some, you know, flow based on where the workers get into the elevator, how, how far they can move. You can end up putting on like an extra elevator, you know, room at an X and a higher level so they can move around quicker. It all works great, but that's not really why I called it out here. The reason I called it out is on the right hand side. This is one of the cleverest components of a player board. And that is there are four different, what would you call them? I, they're, they're like basically little tracks sprockets sprockets that that they basically are they're sprocket yeah kind of gear shapes at the end of these tracks but the track they all start in so that you've only got one icon revealed so the sprocket itself kind of shows you what you're going to find as you pull that track out every level what's the income you're going to get for it, what's the benefit you're going to get for it but you can take an action in the game that lets you basically make these pull these sprockets out and they essentially slide out from the player board so that the track gets longer and you put a token on and then eventually that gives you another token that you can place out on the map. So you kind of have to do that step first where you pull the the sprockets out, you put a token on the income that you covered and then later you can put on the map, which then reveals the income and makes it a more powerful action to take. But just from a component perspective, from an iconography perspective and the theme of just creating your corporation as, you know, a peer of Carnegie, I think the player boards work really well here, even if I don't have that much fun playing the game. Yeah, I don't know what to say about this one, Tim. I I think I need a few more plays to understand what those even do. As cool as they are, you could pull them out, push them back in. I guess that's cool. The game itself, yeah, right? It just kind of didn't hit for me that much either. So player board, despite how cool it is, you're right. The game just kind of like soured for me. So cool player board, weird game. So giving me some mixed emotions here on the uh, the player board itself. Uh, I'll second that mixed emotion. This is one, this game has the rare distinction of being one of a very small handful that I've asked people to stop inviting me to. Uh, <laughs> kind of for the same reason that <laughs> Tim maybe hasn't gone quite that far. But I don't love this game either, but I do agree that that part of it was neat. I'm, I'm not sure if it was that neat, but I did like the gears. I thought that was a neat thing where you can pull it out and have you expand the things that are available to you, the things that you get. So I'll I'll grudgingly concede to that one. I realize it's no distilled board, Chris, but Ooh. I thought it was pretty neat. At least, but at also- least I, put, I put distilled in number four. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing you said was that you kind of you know you got to the point where um, you, you've told people to not invite you anymore, and I haven't gotten to that point yet. And that's just because I'm too nice to, but uh, I, <laughs> I, I probably should do that. And make my life better. Okay. I'm back from my timeout for going out of place. And my number one pick for best player board is Void Fall. This game was designed by Nigel Buckle and David Tuxi, published by Mind Clash Games. The player boards here are just an amazing piece of engineering. First of all, you have the 30 odd billion different factions and those all slide right in to that right side of the player board, revealing the different actions and the different tracks that you're going to have throughout the course of the game. Not to mention the beautiful Eno tool artwork is going to be featured on the right side of that player board. Then you have these incredible square, I don't know, square monocles. I don't know if a monocle has to necessarily be round, but these tech track trackers, tech track trackers. So those are going to be marching up in the middle of this player board, adding to the beauty of this game. Over on the left side, you have some functional space for tracking your different, what are those things called, Tim's achievements or uh, I don't know, the things you put on your left side. uh, I never got to it because there's too many rules. I couldn't understand this game. All I know is the player boards here are absolutely gorge. You're going to install stuff under it's got spots for stuff going underneath stuff for spots on the left stuff for spots on the top it's beautiful it's incredible player boards want to make me learn this game but then the rule book and the billion things inside the box and the heaviness of the box and all the different orange things just make me not want to play the game but i could go on and on and on about these beautiful player boards so that's my number one pick mostly because i think this whole 
I don't want to say gimmick, this whole functionality of sliding in the factions. You have the four different colors, 30 different factions that slide in, make it super functional, super easy to use. If you ever decipher the cryptography of these 50 different icons, it's all right there for you, all laid out in a beautiful way. So those are the player boards from Voidfall. So Adam, you said that there are spaces for things in the left, there are spaces for things in the top, spaces for things on the right. Are there no spaces for things on the bottom? Oh, I meant to say bottom. What goes in on the right is your huge faction card. So that's what's going. <gasps> of course, there's spaces for things okay. on the bottom. Chris, you got all sides for this player board. It doesn't waste any direction, okay, any good. side of this player board. They're all used. Yeah, good. Yeah, th- this is a. Uh, it's funny that you called that out because I'm trying to look at pictures, and so many of the pictures are from the pre Kickstarter production of it that it's like they changed the layout completely. So I was trying to match up. Mm. But yeah, this is great, and in fact, this is what I was trying to say that what Cthulhu Death Me Die should have done which is they give every player these really wonderful, nice, you know, dual layer or even triple layer player boards. And then you could take those cards and just slot them in there. So then everything fits and you've got the people represent, you know, you've got the, the, you, the artwork for the, the character represented and everything. So anyway, Cthulhu Death May Die could have done this and it would have been much better. Mm. But that said, this is an amazing player board. And one of the things that Adam didn't mention is that in a lot of the areas, like for example, when you slot the agendas underneath, there's a place to put the corruption, which is this little orange tentacle token that will kind of say that, hey, you don't get to score that if you've got corruption on that part of the player board. Mm-hmm. And those uh, clear monocle things that Adam was talking about, this is cool because it's a track. And as you move up, you get the benefit that you move to on the track. And it's nice that they're kind of these monocles because you can see th- like it's, it's empty in the middle. It's like this donut, you know, with a little rim on it. So you can see the icon clearly represented when you move up there. But it's another thing that for perfectly fits this corruption token. You can put it in there. And if you got corruption on one of those tracks and you move it up, you don't get the benefit for it. So it, they really did a good job of trying to tie in the mechanism of using that corruption and how it can break your player board and make things not work. And it ties in with the components on here perfectly. So wonderful pick, Adam, if you had not put it on your list, Voidfall definitely would have made my list. That's why I had to get my picks in first so that I could choose all the good ones and keep you guys from getting them. <laughs> I know he always does that. <laughs> That's Tim would always, yeah, Tim always does that. I, I'm looking forward to playing this one again. And I'm just really glad, Tim, that you're going to be there to teach it to us because otherwise I don't think I'd have it in me. Yes. I'm just afraid I've, I've got to teach a bunch of heavy games. See, I got to teach Nucleum again and Voidfall. I got to teach Marrakesh. I'm not, I'm not going to remember how to teach all these <laughs> games by the time we get there. All right. So top in the list for me is... Mechanica, designed by Mary Flanagan, Emma Hobde, and Max Seidman, and published by Resonim Games. This is one that I got right at the beginning of my time as a gamer. And Tim, you and I played this maybe twice, but I think it was just once. Do you remember this one? I do remember it, and we did play it twice. We did twice, okay. It is such an interesting board, and it is one of those games where literally everything that is worth happening is happening on the player board itself. And Let me just talk for a second about the theme here, because it is one of the wackiest, weirdest themes, and I think that kind of adds to the fun. Uh, But this is about a futuristic vacuum cleaner factory. These are like the iRobots of the future that apparently have personalities, and they kind of has this feel in the artwork of the Jetsons, like this really mod mid-century kind of futurism where all the little robot vacuum cleaners kind of have this vague resemblance to... Oh, what was it? Rosie. Rosie, the uh, the cleaning robot from the Jetsons. And there's this kind of odd, like I don't quite get this part, but even though it doesn't come out in the game, there's this odd subtext in the rules and whatnot that these little robots that you're building as vacuum cleaners are going to take over the world and that they're really just looking to kill all the humans. You know, go figure. But each player has a factory and you're building out this factory and there are three different parts. There's the fabricator part over on the far left And then that sends things out into the factory floor, which is this big open spot in the middle. And on the right, you've got the shipping area. And all of this stuff is not blank at the beginning, but very base level. The factory floor itself is nothing but straight lines. You have the conveyor belts. You have very basic versions of the fabricators in the left. And you have like a basic one unit truck over on the right side of the player board. And as you go through this, you're buying more and more 
upgrades and you're making this factory, you're building it out in all these different ways in all three of those areas. So you can get these super deluxe fabricators that produce more than one robot, or you can get these trucks that can carry super huge loads of robots. But the real fun of this game is in the middle on the factory floor, because you've got all these different upgrades you can buy that do different things. Like one may split one level one robot into two level two robots or, you know, whatever, you know, the, whatever the thing is, or it may flip things over directly into another area that gives it some kind of an upgrade. And so you have all these wacky little devices that you could put in your factory, but here's the cool part. Each of them is a little puzzle piece and that I mean, literally shaped like a puzzle piece. So as you're trying to build out the factory, not only are you trying to get the right pieces that get the things done that are going to maximize your production, and maximize the amount of money that you're going to get from these robots and create the most of the best kinds of robots, but you're having to do it using these puzzle pieces. And if you can't fit the puzzle piece in, then you can't use it in that spot. So it, it's this really neat, <laughs> literally puzzle on how to make the most effective factory. And there's literally a million different variations on how you can do it. And again, I mean, the, the art on this thing is just an absolute hoot. So it's worth checking out. This is of all the games, I was thrilled that I had this one on my list that I have not talked about very much, but it really does have an absolutely outstanding game board. In fact, looking at the picture here makes me feel like I need to get this one out and play it again sometime real soon. Yeah, this is a really cool pick, Chris. And what the, the thing that I was so stand out with the game was you have this kind of weird conveyor belt on how you're actually going to get these puzzle pieces. So it's a bit of a market, but it's rotating all the time. The component itself of this conveyor belt is in this like, circular turntable but it sits within the game box and so what you do is you kind of load up the conveyor belt and every turn if somebody doesn't buy something or there may be other things that trigger it, you turn this this little wheel and then the puzzle pieces will drop off into the bottom of the box gone forever in there so there's this weird combination of funky gimmicky pieces to the game that make the production really special to interact with one of the things i i remember feeling strange about though was that the puzzle pieces i'm not sure why they weren't just square tiles because mostly you can rotate take them in different directions there was a couple ones that you had to put a certain direction but uh, i can't remember why that was that was important the game itself though was decently fun it felt like it was just missing a bit of development like like almost everything worked together and if if somebody who is like a, a good board game developer could have gotten in here and maybe cut or or improved on a little bit of the process flow it would have been a lot more fun but i did have a good time with these i remember every time feeling like frustration halfway through the game and then as my factory started to come together and i started to realize that i was going for some big end game points that were going to pay off then you know i enjoyed it more so maybe a game that would get better with more plays but very cool player board for sure i think that's a fair critique of it in fact that's probably one of the reasons why i don't get this one played more often it's been quite a while but i uh i do want to get this one out again and one of these days maybe we'll get it played at a con yeah chris you've talked about this game a few times and i see it has a relatively low rating on board game geek 6.8 mm -hmm. but it looks amazing is this a game you would you would bring and have us play or are you a little hesitant to do that or is it worth playing? What's the deal? I think it's fun, but I think Tim's right. I mean, it's kind of, it's fun, but it does have, it. there is something that's missing. Uh, I would like to get it out again and refresh my memory on it. It has been a long time, but it's one of those ones where in my mind, it maybe, you know, it always seemed like it was a good, it was a good game. It was also a quick game. It was a, it was pretty, pretty speedy, pretty snappy. I think that I should probably, the next time we're up in Portland, maybe bring this one and let you guys give it a try. I don't want it to be one of the two or three games that I pack in my suitcase when I'm flying somewhere, but I could stick it in the car and bring it with me next time you guys are out here. Yeah. It looks amazing. The player boards look fantastic. The whole production looks great. So I'd love to try this one. Mm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll mention that I've only played a two-player with Chris a couple times as well. And so maybe there's a little bit of extra special sauce that comes with more players, maybe the conveyor belt moving more and more options. I'm not really sure, but it might be worth a try at three or four. But it did play quick as well. If I remember right, we, were, we would get a game done in like 45 minutes. Right. So I'm sure if we had a, you know, a third or fourth player, it'd be like an hour, hour 15. And okay. you know, that's almost anything's worth that amount of time. All right. Well, my number one, the final game on here, really does have the best player boards that have ever been made. And I will stick to that. Now, this is also the game, the probably the first game that I ever played, the first hobby board game that taught me that player boards mattered. And this was Scythe. Now, Scythe has been out a little while. We talk, This ends up showing up on almost every 
top five list we make because it's got so many special things going on, especially from a production perspective. And the player boards, I think, are one of the standouts here. Does a couple things. One, it's got those two different boards that you mix and match together. Chris mentioned that on a couple of his picks, but I think Scythe does this really well because you can, you know, have a, a specific faction and then you can have a different player board with it. So every time you play, no matter which faction you're playing with, you're going to get kind of a different mix of how you interact with it. What are the things you can focus on? But let's talk about the political board. But basically, each of you, you know, gets a faction board that just represents your character. It's got beautiful artwork of the characters, the main characters and their animal sidekicks on there. And it's got a couple key elements, including what the special abilities of the mechs are that are printed on there. Your mechs are going to go on that. That's cool. But it's this other board, this dual layer board that represents kind of your politics or your your type of government that you're running. And that's represented by a whole bunch of slots that are going to be used when you're working with different components you're interacting with. This is an engine building game through and through. Um, And probably the most interesting part of it is that at the top of the board are the main actions you're taking. And they're, you know, they're kind of weak at the beginning of the game. Most of them will give you one or two things if you take that action. And at the bottom of the board are special actions you can pay resources for. And they're very powerful, but they're very expensive. They might cost you three or four resources of a specific type. But there's a way to upgrade your player board over the course of the game where you take these little cubes that are covering over some of the benefits on the top of the board, and you can move them to cover over the costs on the bottom of the board. So you really get to see your civilization grow as you're, as you're taking your actions, as you're building out your faction. There's a bunch of other things that get unlocked here. Like if you build monuments out on the board, you're going to take one of the these special buildings off your player board that are kind of covering up icons and make those actions extra strong when you take the action link to that monument. As you put workers out on the board, the costs for those workers are going to get revealed. And it's very thematic. It's like, oh, at first workers are happy to work with you, but then it's going to start to cost you power because you can't invest as much in your military machine, right? You got to spend on your workers, but then you're working them too hard. And the more workers you're putting out there, they're going to start to cost you popularity and you got to pay them. They're going to start to cost you coins. So there's a thematic link between how many workers you place out beyond all that, right? This is a very functional board. It's very cool how it's, how you're really interacting with the board, moving things around. It's got this wonderful Jakob Brzezalski artwork printed behind all of the actions and somehow it doesn't detract it just adds theme you just have this beautiful artwork in the background all the icons are very clear what you can do is very clear but this player board is just a magical thing it's just a a a very special thing to be to be using in a game and i just don't i don't think there's a game that's really kind of reproduced the magic that the side player boards have done since then and that was it was printed in what 2015 so let's get with it publishers you got a perfect example to to, to take from here. All right, Tim, I agree that the player boards are beautiful. The artwork is fantastic and they're super functional. My question is, does it make a difference? The mix and match, the leaders with the different bottom player boards, how does that, do certain combinations, are are they more favorable? What's the difference when you mix and match these, the top player board with the bottom player board? Well, if you play just the base game of Psy that only came with five factions, and so, and the five factions start in their own different, you know, areas of the board, which is always the same, and they have the same kind of resources available to them. So without mixing those boards around, I think the game would have gotten pretty quickly redundant. Like there's a, there's a straight path. Okay. If I'm playing this faction, I always take this action, then this action, then this action Okay. by making those costs and the benefits different on each of those boards, you get one player board and you're like, okay, wow, max are really cheap on this board. I need to focus on that. So I'm going to completely shift up my action. So I think it was really important in the base game. I think when you add in things like the modular board, and now there's nine factions to play with, with all the expansions, it's less important that they're different, but I think it's still a fun puzzle. Every time I get handed that, you know, that political board, I have to decide, okay, what are the things that I should really focus on this, this game? And how do I make that work with my faction? So for me, I think it, I think it's fun, but I think it was most important when there was only five factions and, everyone started in the, you know, in a normal place. And I, I ask with no intent of criticism only because I've played the game maybe a handful of times, five or six times. So I don't really know like how much of a difference that makes per faction. Well, I think that's a great choice, Tim. It is truly in your words, a magical player board. All right. Well, that's our top five. Did you guys have any 
you know, any runners up. I mentioned all my runners up while I was talking about, <laughs> about the player boards I was talking about, but anything else you want to call out or anything about player boards in general you think are worth mentioning? I was thinking about mentioning terraforming Mars. So from the base game, you have these flat pieces of paper ones where you, you have the sneeze and scatter problem again. You could bump that thing and your cubes and your trackers and your money are going to go everywhere and you're, it's going to be a mess as to where they all came from, I'm trying to put that back together. But the publishers realized this and with certain expansions, the big box mega one and with turmoil, I believe came these other player boards, the dual layer player board that we've been talking about so much tonight. They did have slots for everything and everything fit right in. So you have these six little areas of production that are all nicely laid out for you. They track everything. You put your little money cubes in there. And that was one of my first games coming into the hobby. And I really enjoyed that player board as a way to track production and make this and make that. So that was on my runner up. It went from bad and maybe frustrating to really neat and excellent. I had to get some third party ones because I played the game so much. But now they, they realize that and they have this updated set of player boards that are really nice to handle and play with. Yeah, my runner ups. We talked about some of them. Uh, Scythe, I wouldn't call it a runner up. I just, you know, I, I didn't pick that one for because partially I thought Tim would probably want to use that one, but partially because, you know, I have talked about it so much, but that's a, an amazing choice. Same as with Adam, I would have probably considered putting Terraforming Mars on there. I didn't on that one just because the base game version is such garbage and you really do have to have the upgrade for it. But the upgraded version is absolutely terrific. One other quick runner up that I had was Calico, which is a flat out game where you're quilting. And of course, you can't have, you know, your quilt pieces flying all over the place. So it's one of the first two layer boards that I played on. In this one, you're putting all of your quilt pieces down inside of the the dual layer boards so that they're going to stay nice and neat right where you put them. And, and I always thought that was a really nice touch in in that game. Those are my runner ups. Those are great picks, Chris. Another one I was thinking about mentioning was Fractal Beyond the Void. I talked about that a lot maybe a few months ago, but this has a very nice player board leader combo where you slot those in kind of like with Scythe, except the right side. The, there's one part that's not asymmetric at all, but there's a couple rough edges with it. The print on there is really small, so it's kind of hard to see what's going on. It's a beautiful player board and I love it and it's super functional. They're there are things that they could have done slightly better, but not bad for a first time publisher. And I think these player boards are just fantastically cool. Artwork is great and a lot of functionality there. Just some rough edges that could be improved upon. And I think they're going to come back strong when the love for this game is expanded throughout the globe. <laughs> <laughs> also, not not uh, we're not sponsored by the the publisher of Fractal Beyond the Void. It's just a great game. Just a great game. I, I do have one more pick that I did really want to add on my list, but it has one kind of critical design flaw, but this is Nucleum. And Nucleum has a wonderful player board. Everybody has kind of a standard player board, but then you pick a technology set, one of the four techs in, this, in the game, and then you get this little sideboard with it. And this is the coolest part, but also the broken part. And that is there's like these little slots. They have little tabs in them. So there's like nine different technologies you can develop over the course of the game. And at the start, they're all kind of slotted in on the to the left. And then if you develop it, then you can move it in and it slides into the right. And it looks like it's going to work great. Mostly does. And I'll get to the flaw in a second. Beyond that, the player board's really cool. There's a lot, it's dual layer, so you got these tracks at the top. You're built. You've got all these buildings that you can build over the course of the game, and they t they clearly tell you what they're gonna, you know, what kind of points you're gonna get for them. And then over on the right hand side, there are these little uh, turbines you can build, and so those are slotted over there. And as you remove them, you get extra income benefits and stuff. But also, depending on the tech set you're with, you get to kind of plug in this extra benefit that building some of your turbines would give you. The problem is with that tech board on the left-hand side and that basically that was the punch board. So you had this tech board and then you had the techs in them, so you would punch them out. But what that means is that when you're playing with it, if you try to put that tech in there, they're so tight and the, the little thin pieces between where the techs go are so flimsy that it's a lot harder to work with in reality than it looked like it was going to if you just saw the board. So it's not terrible. Like you, I've played it, my copy a few times. It hasn't broken or anything, but I could see it breaking. I, I think it's likely to at some point if it gets a lot of heavy use. Luckily, this game's heavy enough that it's not going to get a lot of use. But um, but it it you know otherwise like you know this was a this was a cool cool on paper concept didn't quite work perfectly in in execution, which is why I left it off my list. You make a good point, Tim. I'm looking at the pictures here, and it is that little skinny cardboard piece between the different 
theoretically slidey text over there. So yeah, I could see that those getting damaged. Interesting how those were just the, that was the punch board itself. All right. Well, cool. I think that'll wrap up this week's topic. Before we leave for the day, I do have a quick review to mention. And uh, this was a five-star review from Ada Pippo from Great Britain. This is one of our UK listeners here. And the, the title was A Little Week. Oh, wait, no, that's not right. It was A Little Tweak. <laughs> um, so the, the review starts out with, the show overall is quality, good chemistry between the hosts with helpful interaction. I listen to this on the way to work, and it's a really nice way to start the day listening to reviews of my hobby. And then he goes on to say, I do have a question, though, something he's asking for. And this is the tweak he mentions. I won't read it all out, but basically what he said is, can you mention the player count when you're talking about games? What, you know, in the game description, what's the player count? And, um, and also our preferred player count when we've had the chance to play it. I went back and listened to some older reviews and we do occasionally, usually Chris was the best about this when he makes a description, he would, le- he would list the player counts that were available. And then I try to remember to mention them as we're talking about that play, how many people did we play with that night? So, um, you know, we, we have tried that to some extent, but I don't think we've been really specific about it. And I think this is great feedback. We will be happy to try to mention the player count as we're talking about games, describing them in the future. And I hope that helps. But thank you so much for the nice review. Really appreciate that you're listening and that you're enjoying the show and uh, love your feedback. And I think that's actually, um, I mean, we don't really talk too much about the player count other than maybe mentioning how many players can play it, but having, you know, what the best player count might be is is a great idea. Although, I mean, there's a standard answer. Best player count is three, always. Every game, doesn't matter. <laughs> always, always, it's always three. three. <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally agree with you guys. That's a, a really good feedback. I feel like if a game really fits a certain player count, I try to say it. I probably don't always do it. So that's something I could definitely work on. Great feedback. All right. Well, that will wrap up this week's episode. We do have a little bit of uh, traveling with our hosts over the next couple of weeks. So we're probably going to be sticking to some of these special topics over a couple of weeks. Um, next game review might be a few weeks out from here. But we also might be getting a guest in pretty pretty soon as uh, Chris is traveling with his family to Iceland. That's exciting, Chris. Good, good luck on that trip. Hope you meet some honest-to-God Vikings out there. there I hope so, too. Maybe I'll board game with them. All right. Until next week, take care, everybody. Good night, all. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> so cute.